Hello world, we're recording. Welcome Hi. back. <laughs> uh, I'm Christina Carmody. For anyone that's following along or coming and tuning in for the first time, uh, but we have the lovely Diana Matos with us here today. Thanks really for having me. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering if you could start us off by uh, telling, because I don't even know how you kind of got into this, like your first experiences with cameras or on set in general. Oh my gosh. Well, one day in a land far, far away, we were talking about Nona Katusano, who you interviewed uh, recently. It might, one of my first experiences on set, it wasn't the first, I was turning 19 years old and I was a camera PA um, in Romania on an American film. Um, I got the job because I had expressed my interest in being in camera. My father was a war photographer and a news cameraman. Um, I was always near cameras, so I expressed my interest in camera to my godfather, who was a line producer on this film at the time. Had never tried it before because I was young and so scared to dip into that world. Like, I had never futzed with a film camera outside of school. Like, I, I felt like I wasn't ready, you know, like that, that whole stigma that we yeah. have of like being afraid to dip into things. I um, finally had the confidence to just say, I don't want to be on a set in camera, in camera. I don't want anything else in the world. I just want that, right? And he was like, well, you know, I could get you a camera PA job if you'd be interested in being a camera PA. We can't pay you, but we can pay for your stay. I'd say bro in the Miami likeness, bro. I was so excited to just be on this set that I thought that was like more than enough. I didn't need to get paid. I'll, 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 I'll find food. Um, he he put me up um, in an apartment that was near the stadium in uh, in Bucharest, and it was like it was great. I kept my windows open, listened to concerts. Super cheap apartment. I lived off of yogurt. <laughs> I didn't eat meat, so it was really hard to live there. But um, <laughs> it was an amazing experience. Yeah, <laughs> um, because the first thing that happened was that the the A Focus Fuller and the cinematographer met me. It was their prep week and we were organizing the truck together. And the first thing they did was that they had me build an Airy Cam ST. And I was just like, okay, I've, I've shot 16, Super 16 and 35. I've built the cameras before, but I've never approached this camera. Oh my God, what do I do? Um, and I looked at all the pieces. I was like, this is actually kind of like every other camera I've built. I can do this. And I put it on the, on the, not the pedestal, but like on the top of the shelf. I slid it onto the sliding base plate and I was like, let's do this. Um, and they were excited about that. They were like, okay, all right. She's serious about this. And then cut to over a hundred degree heat, shooting in a stage with no air conditioning, hauling mags all over the place, up to 22 cameras. Like it, it, it broke me in. And about halfway through the shoot, um, they made me into a second AC because they had their loader and their loader was, was committed. This like this Romanian guy was like 50 years old, didn't want to do the paperwork. I was doing the paperwork for him. Um, so they just bought me up to second AC and it was, it was pretty awesome. Then I finished the job and I get offered another second AC job on a movie over there. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to drop out of school and that's it. I'm, I'm going to be a second AC out in Romania. That's it. And uh, I called my mom to let her know. And she's like, what are you kidding? You have a scholarship. I was like, but this is what I want. And I've been offered a job, employment. And she's like, no, what are you stupid? You don't drop a scholarship. You gotta finish school and then you do that. You can always go back to it. She flew to Romania to convince me out of it. Wow. And so I went back to school. I dragged myself back to school and I finished. Um, Which school did you but, I went to the University of Miami. 
um, it was nice that I was able to convince the dean to make that three and a half month period of working on that film count toward my degree. Nice. But it took a lot of arguing, a lot of back and forth meetings with the dean, and then he said yes awesome. um, in the end because I was like, what what counts more toward a degree? than real onset experience. And I always knew that I wanted to be a cinematographer. So um, yeah, that was my first dip into it. And then, you know, I became a camera assistant coming out of school. Uh, I worked at a small rental house in Miami and then decided that it was time to get some union experience. And I moved to New York, started all over again, working for Panavision. And that's that. That's amazing. I mean, th those are the moments that I find really inspiring because we all have different paths into this. Like, I, I mm -hmm. feel like when I was growing up, it was very much like you do this job or you want this career, so you go to that school and then it, ha then you're there, and it's like, Bruh. and then <laughs> since I've been on set, it's like everyone has a different path into it, a path through it. You know, whether they have families or not, after they're in it for a certain month, it's also exciting to me. I mean, I'm still new to it in a way, but. Um, but no, thinking. you were a PA. You were a PA, right? Why camera? Like, what made you go, you know what? That's it. That's my vocation. And go up to the guys and ask for a job. What made you do it? Oh, gosh. Putting me on the spot. I love it. Yes! Uh, this is a I, conversation, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, my answer is I, once I was on set, and really got a sense of like how all the organs and all the mechanics of it all functioned. I saw the camera crew as like the eye of the storm and they look so calm there that I was just like, I thought they were like the, the coolest ninjas I've ever seen. And there's something about how they handled that storm with so much grace. And then they were doing something that was like, I'm using so many mixed metaphors, but they were just, just doing all these things, with all these, bits and pieces I had no idea what they were doing but they just were handling it and like keeping their cool and you know there's always those people on set that are yellers or those people that are like running around or like you know you go how many times have you seen someone with a uh, walkie and they're like why isn't this here where's the car like someone like uh, frantic but the camera people like had it together I was like Ugh, what's that about we seemingly have it together. We like quite, we quietly have it together. No, quietly. we quietly don't have it together. Yeah. But we try to keep it together, you know. Yeah. As as we can. yeah. I mean, if anything, I, I feel like that's such a, such a great way to process life in general and how you organize mm -hmm. things and how you prepare for things. I mean, if anything, that's taught me a lot in the past four years of, you know, if you, you put something in one place and it's there, you know it's going to be there. <laughs> like if you, right. you know, it's like you organize your locker or organize your storage. Like if it's in that place, it's always in that place and you're going to find it in that place. And that like, that just for someone who has a lot of like OCDs and anxieties, that's like so calming for me. Like a nice truck that's like labeled and all the gear yeah. is like, like red and blue. It's like, what a dream. Yeah, like our, our playroom, as you can see, is kind of messy, right? But like, if you see the rest of our house, if there were a blackout, you can find anything you need in the dark. Be and I feel like I drive my family crazy with it because of this second AC training. Like everything is labeled, everything has its place. It's got to go back to its place. Um, you know, it's embedded in you forever. I mean, especially during quarantine, I swear I, I had some gaff tape lying around and I just started like labeling things in my house. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you know, getting real nuts. Like it was so funny because we were like reorganizing just all your extra expendables and storage and everything. And then next thing you know, I'm seeing my, my boyfriend use like the can of air as he's like cleaning things now. And <laughs> just so like, funny. don't use my can of air. <laughs> I'm like, I only have so many. The rest are on the truck. <laughs> exactly. Um, but actually, I have a question for you in regards to your career, because um, what I found uh, really interesting is that, you know, sometimes people get into this because like, I want to be the cinematographer, I want to be the director. And then next thing you know, it's like life happens. 
you know, and then, you know, mm-hmm. next thing you know, you're in a certain classification or you have such a connection with a collaborator that you're kind of in one role for maybe longer than expected. So just curious what your experience has been like. Oh my gosh. It's, I've had so <laughs> many of those. Cause like I had, I had a period where I was in a chem second AC and I was so uh, comfortable in that position. Mind you, I was shooting the entire time. I, I've been shooting longer than I've been through the camera department in union positions. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. I've, I've been shooting since I was a teenager. Um, but then I would take these long lapses of being an assistant, being a second, being a first i feel like they were all different lives honestly being being a camera operator and it's so easy to stop um because you find your circles of people you get comfortable doing it you love being by the cart you like having your cart organized a certain way you like you know you know the motions of even though our job is so unpredictable you know the motions of everything you know what life is going to be like if you go to a certain rental house um i've had i feel like i've had nine lives in the camera department and each one of those things each one of those lives were very um satisfying um especially operating operating is just i honestly feel like it's one of the best jobs on set you're not you're not having to like bring the gear to set lug anything lug anything back wrap anything you're part of the creative conversations of everything it's truly a creative job um you're not in as deep in the politics as a cinematographer is um it's an incredible job it's a beautiful job. And that's why I'm like, hey, I'll operate for my friends, of course, um, because I love it. I really do. Um, it's, it's tough to leave it, though. I'm like a Libra. So once I get comfortable, <laughs> you can't get me out. That's so hard. And that's why it took me so long to DP permanently it was because mm. I took those great lapses. And in those great lapses, like when I did a, a whole TV job, as an operator, I had to give up shooting jobs to maintain my position. And I'd get that that DP who's in his 70s looking at me like, oh, don't feel bad. You're going to grow a lot by being here. You know? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's just, oof. oof. Um, it's, it's difficult to make those those strides. Like, part of me is like, oh, if I could go back, I I would, because I got accepted into NYU and didn't go. I was like, if I could go back, I'd probably just be a DP out of school and skip all of that, right? But then another side of me is like, I'm really glad I did it this way. I, I take the long route, but eventually I'll get there, you know? Yeah. There's no need to rush it because there's so much to learn on the way there and there's so many people that you meet on the way there it's it's very gratifying plus I'm like hmm, when am I gonna retire maybe like 40 years from now so I got another 40 years of this mm. so I'm not an, another part of the process too is selecting the projects that speak to you as a DP and I'm very happy that I was able to a learn that, which took me forever to learn, sure. and b um, be able to have a job in between those projects that I was so selective about, um, and and jobs that gave me and my family insurance, and jobs that I cared about with people that I cared for, you know. So it's that that I mean, it's it's hard to take that back. As a Libra, you can argue, argue both sides of an argument, and it drives people crazy. But I'm like, oh, on one end, I'd erase, like, all of that history if I decided to go back to school and then just be a DP right out of the gate. Um, I, I'm just not the fake it till you make it type. I mean, that's what I found so authentic about people's personalities on set. You know, like you meet those people that are just so gung ho, like I need to do this by 30, by 40, by blah, you know, and then 
maybe they're only hired by certain people or, you know, I, especially when I was day playing a lot, you know, you'd meet different circles of people and, you know, whether you actually had the experience or a certain resume, it was really just you as a person. Like how do you as a human interact with these other people and feel comfortable around them for 18 hours a day? You know, it's a very different conversation versus like, oh, you just technically can do the job. It's like, I actually enjoy spending time with you and doing the job. Yeah. Um, and then once you, once you hit the leadership positions, like being the A first, like being an operator, like being a DP, it's funny, you, you get hired, you come on set, and then you meet certain people who you've been talking on the phone with who've never seen you. And then you come on set and they, they look at you and they're like, you know, like, you're young, you know? Um, <laughs> they, look, they look at you and they, they, they see this little Hispanic woman. Um, they're like, oh, you're, whoa, you know? And then they, they get past that one. <laughs> and then there's the warm up, there's the warm up uh, yeah. rounds until you, you get on set, you get the work done. They're like, oh you know, this is great. I love this relationship. There's like that get to know period in mm. terms of that too. Whereas like as an assistant and sometimes as an operator too, you, you have your circles that hire you because people hire from within Yeah, and they, they know your story. You know, they have embraced my eccentricities as a, as a Latina, as a uh, loud Hispanic that, that suppresses that on set definitely suppresses that on set. Um, but, um, you know, they, they embrace you. They love you for it. Like they know your story. They know your background. They know, they've known you since you were this big, you know? So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Are there certain individuals that you, you can say you've had like the longest collaborations with either as in they hired you for x amount of time or you hired them for x amount of time i have i have a history um as a camera assistant of just going back to the same circles um but as a dp no actually because i've had the great luck and misfortune of being hired by different directors all the time and the directors mm. who i've worked with yeah before haven't yet done their next project or um their their next project is still in development or you know their next project is being pushed over financing or whatever it is um or they just stopped you know working on movies or whatever it is so i end up working with new directors who have taken me down different paths entirely and are opening up my mind as a DP and I'm very grateful for that because one thing that coming up in the union world does is like it programs you to think a certain way that you have to deliver just this like uh, beautiful sharp American image um this like very slick looking clean image um mm. at times uh with the DPs that I've worked with at least. Um, and you have to deprogram that. You, you just, um, you learn how to just get rid of that. And each one of the projects is its own thing and has its own, it's its own living, breathing thing. And you got to treat it as that. Um, so yeah, there's not like any one person that I've had along collaboration with and I actually think that's a blessing I mean it's been really curious for me because depending on who I've talked to in the past either on set or in this series you get very different answers you know there's some people that have been mentored or been like the right I've been hand, mentored or like I the guess right I should guy. I guess I should I, I <laughs> guess I should mention uh my mentors I consider my mentors to be uh Bradford Young uh, I did a couple of projects with him. Really? I did um, a most violent year with him. And then we did an art project 
that he was asked to do in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, Crown Heights and bed Yeah. about the history of that area. And oh, cool. it was so fulfilling. Um, and since we've been able to connect a few times, he's been so busy up until COVID. And that's nice about this COVID era. Is that yeah. like you, can, you can actually reach out to people and they're at home so they can talk to you. Yeah. Um, he's, He's just very simple about it. He's like, I'm proud of you. I see you. Keep going. You know? Um, and I'm just like, oh my God, oh my God, what do I do with that? Like, what's next? I don't know. You know, that's the thing about yeah. shooting is that you don't know what the next opportunity is sometimes, especially if you're not represented. Um, mm. But like, yeah, but yeah, Brad Young has really opened my eyes in a way that I just, I, I had, I never seen the world that way. Like he talked to me about, he was the first one who talked to me about choosing the right scripts. Oh, interesting. He like, yeah. He talked to me about, um, you know, his life in Brooklyn and I won't go um, too in detail about that necessarily, but like you take certain risks to be able to wait for the script that you think is gonna open up a side of the industry for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, that's probably slowed down um, the type of work that I get, but I think that ultimately it's worth that risk. It's worth the leap because um, you, you end up putting out there the type of work that you wanna get in the end. Um, yeah, that's just like how I'm getting to that point um, where like the work is starting to come in a nice ebb and flow or pre-COVID, the yeah. work was, was starting to come in a nice flow. Um, and then uh, I I did a movie with Maddie Lee Batik and it was great because like I had to come in and out of that set. Do you know Aurelia Wimborn, the focus puller? I do know her. I'm not sure if we've worked together. I just met her in certain circles, but I, I hope you do work with her. She's like, yeah. she's so badass. I love her so much. Um, and her temperament too. She's just fabulous. Um, but one day where I wasn't there, I had to do something like I had a doctor's appointment, took the day off, whatever, placed myself. Um, Maddie was like, ah, I have a friend that needs someone uh that's that wants to shoot this fifty thousand dollar short um that's like twilight inspired um uh, you know he's like talking to everybody like who's who's around what you know who who's who's up for something like this um and aurelia's like you know diana shoots right and he's like what are you kidding me S send me her website and he he looks it up right away he's like you have to do it he he, he lets that's me know awesome. you have to do this and it was like that, like wow. support, like, like that, that fast. Um, and it's nice that people like that see you, even though your work isn't necessarily at the budget level that would attract the eye, they can see past that. They can see your potential past that. Um, it's, it's nice to have mentors like that. Uh, and another mentor of mine, uh, is Qian Tran. She's okay. a DP based out of LA. Um, and I met her at Sundance. The mentorship relationship that we have is just me like calling her and she goes, call me anytime um, to talk about life choices on top of work choices. Mm. Um, because she has two kids and I have a kid. And I need someone to bounce these ideas off of. Someone who knows what the, what the weight of that choice means, you know, and she's helped me a lot with those decisions. So I'd say that they're, they're, they're my mentors. That's awesome. I mean, those, those support systems are kind of vital, right? Like that's something that I think really hits you in different phases of your life. But I think that's something that so many people don't talk about in their careers as if like your career, your work life, your professionalism all is in this bubble that's separate from your body 
or your politics yeah. or your family life. It's all in there. But um, I think it's, I know we, we've both talked about it. It's, it's really interesting when you see people try to separate it and then people actually really successful when they are integrated and they really are authentic to themselves in that way. Brad is a father of three. And I don't even know how you get it done with three. I have no idea. <laughs> but when I met him, he only had one child and it's still super, super demanding of you. Part of it is having a partner who understands you, you know, who understands what your goals are, who understands that, um, you know, doing this as a career means more to you than just a job, you know, so the investment of time that you make is truly part of you. Um, so part of, part of it is that, and he was one of those folks. And one of the reasons why I kept pursuing him to find the right answers was because of that. I mm. wanted a family and I want, I saw him doing it because I hadn't, I don't think I had ever worked with a female DP yet um who had a family um so i saw him having a family and i was like how, how do you do it how do you do it it's like it's literally one foot in front of the other like a marathon you take it day by day yeah. you don't try to juggle all the balls in the air at the same time you know just day by day little by little and i started learning that through him yeah i mean that's what i think is so I feel like the word interesting always comes up when I do this because with COVID and with quarantine, people are really reevaluating how all these things balance, how you maintain the marathon when you're not on set for 70 hours a week or something. And so I was really curious if you want to talk how maybe uh, in the, gosh, it's weird to say this now, like the pre-COVID days, how you kind of balanced all those things out in your life versus how you're balancing it now during COVID. Oh my gosh. Um, back before COVID, I'm like thinking of my life before then. Um, right before it started, I was finishing up prep for um, a national spot that I was going to shoot for LinkedIn. And I was about to fly out to go to LA um, to do that and work with a fantastic production crew and agency that I really admire. Um, so I felt like there was like circulation, the things were like beginning to happen. And then I was going to, um, uh, start pre-production on a feature in April, uh, mm. in Arizona. So, and I, and I knew I had that movie and it still do have that movie like braided in my mind. Um, so I was completely ready. I had prepared everything for it, had all my diagrams, had um, thoughts of like an A, B, and C situation for everything. I had it all here and I was ready to fly out, had organized childcare with the family. Um, we had had our rhythm like of when the family was gonna go fly out to see me in Arizona, like we had our rhythm. We already knew exactly what it was gonna entail. And then COVID happened and just like threw everything in a tailspin because I had like, I myself and the family had gotten used to, okay, she has to go every now and then to go do her job and then she'll be back. And, you know, and then we're going to go back to normal after that. But like, now they're used to having me around all the time. And <laughs> I'm just like, guys, remember, like, I have a job. <laughs> I'm not a housewife. Um, and I'm going to leave again, eventually. And they're all like, you know, mom's here forever. And I love your scones and cookies and pancakes and everything you make. And uh, they're used to like this daily routine that I've gotten them into. Uh, at some point that's gonna then start fluctuating again so it's it's been really interesting to see them get used to me being at home all the time um don't imagine we'll see, I don't... we'll see what happens when the gates open 
and yeah. we're back to work. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. I mean, I'm just a, a plant lady. I don't have any pets or, or kids, so it's, you know, different type of <laughs> home maintenance. But I'm just curious, actually, how... Uh, plants are good. They don't... Plants don't talk back. They don't <laughs> bark at you when they're mad. They don't pee on anything. That's true. They just, uh, <laughs> like, brown or yellow when they're a little, like, discontented. Um, <laughs> But I'm just curious because I guess as visual people, um, I've been, I guess, really like seeking inspiration or curious just like how other people kind of create that inspiration for themselves. And I, I realize now after doing this series for so long and being in quarantine so long, it is a certain privilege to have access to learning a new hobby or have access to these collections of cinema to like study up on the greats you know but I'm just curious how it's worked out for you and how you stayed as a creative professional creative during all this what just like you I used to take photographs and develop them in the dark room back in the day so I've created my own little dark room oh yeah um, That's awesome. and I've been processing my own film got rid of the digital camera and just started processing my own film constantly and that has helped me you know have some me time outside of taking care of my son it it gives me just this like moment of meditation and the smell of the chemicals and everything i'm like oh i feel at home you know um it's it, that has helped me a lot mentally that and exercise has helped me a lot but to maintain inspired I have a long list of movies that I want to yeah. get through um and like after the baby's asleep I managed to get through like one a day nice. um that yeah that's what I've been doing and listening to a lot of other cinematographers talk about their process has helped me see that we're actually a lot alike um it, as different as all the cinematographers are and how their eyes are all different we actually have a similar thought process and I have also learned about new thought processes that I will implement on sets like oh I never thought about that before I never thought of thinking it in that sort of way um just listening to other people has helped me broaden my horizons a lot that and um, I've joined a new group of cinematographers of color called Sporus. Oh, awesome. They've been, they've been really inspirational too, yeah. because I've met people that I had never heard of from all over the world. And just learning about DPs that have experience in other countries and their process is just mind blowing because I've been stuck in this like, American Union bubble for so long mm -hmm. that hearing about Mexican DPs and their pro their their process, um, German DPs and what it's like to work over there. Now I'm like, hey, maybe I'll start working in Spain or something. You know, now I'm thinking maybe we'll buy an apartment over there and move over there and just work part-time there are some people that work don't just work by coastal there are dps that work in like australia and barcelona you know they're based in multiple cities around the world that makes the world so much smaller in a way um and now we're all connected online and we could talk to one another it's i don't know it's so dope it's been pretty cool to get to know people that i had never met before and that in itself is an inspiration to me i mean I, that's the the same experience i've had with creating this like movie list of like ones i've never seen or kind of yeah. classics to watch again and it really made me think that i have such this first layer of like um, like american like it's like of course you watch these american directors that talk about this american experience and then after like my partner and i we made this big list and we're like wow how many women directors are on here? How many international directors are on here? Like, are you kidding me? Like, it's just wild to think of like these, these great epics or these like, you know, I don't know, like the, all the Oscar best picture nominees or something. And you're like, this has given us such an opportunity to really expand ourselves because clearly America 
that's falling apart. So why not look at how- Hey, we need to think of our exit strategy, right? <laughs> you know, like, you never know. Once November comes around, girl, <laughs> find your way out find that other passport that like your grandma is gonna enable you to get like get it because we gotta get ready to get out of here <laughs> no. so, like it's 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 crazy it's crazy yeah. being here right now I'm also really interested in the cinema that'll come out of our troubles gosh that is a whole that's an uncharted territory for sure I mean, which makes me which makes me think that we should just stay here and hold a fort down they mean you know. i mean I, I didn't mention it to you before but the project i was working on right before COVID happened was like a february to may season one of a new amazon show and uh it was still entitled we still don't know what it will ever be titled um but they're planning on shooting it in january next year now and you know we got say out of 10 episodes we got maybe two done, maybe three. Um, but it was so, that was the first time on a project, even as an assistant, that I felt really like kind of proud to be there. First of all, like the crew itself was just more diverse. You know, I had Caitlin Maychuk operating and Vanessa Vieira as the first on the B team there. Um, a bunch of Latino guys too. It is such an amazing crew. And the story is really about these four black women, a mix of straight and queer, and them just experience life in New York City. And um, I think they were kind of trying to stay that like almost Sex and the City girls rom-com vibe. Mm -hmm. But now it's like the potential that that show could have talking about the world right now, like is, is astronomical, sure. you know? And For so sure. if anything, it's like, I'm glad I wasn't on a show like Law and Order or Blue Bloods, you know, and you're like, oh, I don't know what it'll feel like to go back onto that kind of set right now. But to like, yeah. you know, hopefully go back and then say like, I, you know, I didn't necessarily choose that project. The, you know, the ACs, the other assistants, the DP, they chose me. But to, to consider the possibility of continuing that story and continuing to see what they say with that, like the leverage you could get through that visual medium is like, I kind of want to stay and, and hope for the best for them. Like that could be. Have you, have you seen a show called I May Destroy You on HBO? No, I'm going to write that down. I think, I think you'll love it. I think you'll love it. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. I okay. think you should just go oh, in cold. Go <laughs> Based on what you just told me, it, you should just go in cold. That, mo that show changed me for good. Oh, um, okay. It's. <laughs> just content that's willing to look at the world at its ugly face and yeah. react to it well i mean that's that's something look I've, look at it in the eyes and just go noticed, this is how i <laughs> react to this earth and the way it is right now and this aggression and i'm not sorry I mean, you know, um, my, I'd, I'd love, love to hear what you think about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll let you know. I just, I've noticed that in my family and in my experience, so much of entertainment can be this just escapist reality. That I can get out of my world, go to the theater and see what the stars are up to. And, you know, the ability that documentaries, like that very almost real-time journalistic feel just you know, even when they are a, a piece of fiction like the power that a story can have you know it's just it's really phenomenal especially how much tv has evolved you know like and when it used to be just the big movies and like you know it's like just the hollywood town to all the power that all the streaming networks have with it just it seems like there's there's so much potential there you would just hate to see it really not use its full potential and just go back to oh like, my god yeah and you'd what? have like the cast that was casted by the usual suspects ca casted with the usual suspects as well um now you see faces that you've never seen before now they shoot in countries and have stories like with their original language not um in english in a different country with a completely different culture um 
it's so refreshing to see that it actually is beginning to look like what the earth is composed of um and i'm okay with that yeah i'm okay with that are there other besides i may destroy you are there other either tv shows or movies that have very much inspired you during this time or just like in general oh, oh, always put oh it on. yeah oh, that's a classic i watched last night i watched a movie called watermelon woman oh amazing. that's so good um very indie um the perspective of a character who is black and lesbian um it's 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 about a girl who's making a documentary about the first black woman that she saw in cinema in like the 30s and 40s and in the credits they gave her a name she's one of the first women to have a credit one of the first black women to have a credit in the end credits. Uh, they gave her a name, The Watermelon Woman. So this movie is about her search to find out more about The wow. Watermelon Woman. Um, that for me was just like, I can't, I, I, I didn't imagine this sort of story being out there. I, this is the sort of story that I've always like been waiting to see and yet it came out in the 90s, you know? Um, and I just discovered it now. It took a pandemic to learn about something like this and to stumble upon it and see it. Um, I found it on the Criterion Collection app in the Roku. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've also been re-watching movies that I love, but no, there's more. There's more that I've stumbled upon and like, completely fell in love with there's um what's that movie that's shot by uh, damian garcia who is a mexican dp oh it in english it's i'm no longer here i'm no longer here that movie was fantastic it, it's not about bob dylan is it or am i getting those mixed no up? no no um i'll have to i'll have to send it to you okay it's it's um I believe it's shot mostly in Mexico okay. and in New York. Okay. It's either in Mexico or Ecuador, but it's in a place that's really, that has a lot of mountains. You'll see the vistas are just beautiful. The way that it's shot feels so calculated, yet so, um, so naturalistic at the same time. And it allows for enough space for the actors to play in the frame. It's just, it's beautifully shot. Um, I just re yeah. reacted so strongly to that movie. Um, I also, um, I have a lot of favorite DPs that are actually not from the States at all. So it's been nice to look into the list of their work. Yeah. And see what their earlier work is and have a chance to watch them. Um, when you watch other cinematographers work, do you see their, like, do you see like their kind of hand on it? Like their imprint or their aesthetic? Whether they like it or not, they have an aesthetic. And I have no idea what mine is. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was going to be my follow-up question. I think it's so <laughs> fascinating, you know, because I feel like when you, you look at these other people that have years and years of a career, you're like, oh, you can tell what Deacons looks like. You know what I mean? Like you could tell, mm -hmm. and then it's so interesting because then when you're in it, sometimes I mean, do you think that there's a way that someone would describe you now? Like if, or have you had any feedback from, I don't know, producers or certain directors? Like, well, I saw your reel, and you seem like this type of. Oh man! The other day I got this um, a script for a suspense film, and I had never gotten a script for a suspense. Suspense film. Maybe. Yes, horror before, like in the way past, but yeah. suspense, like a classic American Ooh. suspense film. And I'm like, yeah, I've always wanted to shoot a suspense film. Yeah. And I called him, I was like, yo, I've always wanted to shoot a suspense film. And he goes, I'm glad you called it a suspense film. And he, <laughs> he goes on to tell me, your work reminds me of, of Sven Nyquist's work. And I was like, that is the nicest thing that anybody wow. has said to me. 
And I was like, what are you kidding? Are you crazy? <laughs> this man is a master. And he goes, no, there's just this. You can tell that that the cinematographer that I was looking at is a storyteller. And that's what it means to you. It's story above all. And I was like, whoa, wow. I, it, it, takes, it takes someone else telling me for me to know. I just, like I've mentioned to you, I've had all these different kinds of projects with all these different directors, so different, different genres entirely. But I just, I take the inclinations that I think are best for each one of the stories. And I guess the common denominator is me. So there has to be a common look, right? Um, I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> that's okay. It is. I mean, if anything, that's such a marvelous compliment. Like, I hope you could- From him? Yeah, I like nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> I would have too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like I could talk to you all day, um, but I imagine maybe if you're watching on YouTube, you're like, are they gonna wrap it up or what? <laughs> but, yeah, I bet. I bet. I don't even know what time it is. Wow. But before time I know, but before we go, um, one of my kind of final questions I've been asking everyone is what they think sets will feel like. I, it's weird to even say it now, but it does sound optimistic. I'll say in the post-COVID world, but in the, the world where we're in these final stages and we're getting back to things, are there, I don't know, are there feelings or even just hopes that you don't lose something in all of this? Or I know, I'm curious what your thoughts are. I think that eventually we'll end up trying to make a set that resembles what we had before. Yet at the same time, we'll have constant reminders of those violations, those health and COVID violations that are happening on set that will also serve as a reminder to each one of us that we are responsible for our own safety and for the safety of our crew. Um, that's what I think it'll be like. I think it'll have constant reminders that we have to protect one another our own crew and ourselves. And I think that's the only way we're going to get through this. I don't think we should wait for some sort of document to come out that everyone is going to implement. We shouldn't necessarily wait for things to be made safe for us. I think that um, we're just going to have to take it under our own wing. Yeah. I think that's the only way. Well, I'm so honored to have your time and chit chat with you. <laughs> uh, I really hope that when we get back into things, that if you're back in New York, we get to work together. So that would oh be yeah, I hope so too. I'm glad I got to meet you, Christina MC. Thanks. <laughs> um, I guess we could press stop recording unless there's any last piece of. Do you want to like leave the world with anything or not? I don't know. There's, Next episode. <laughs> okay, sounds good.